if you will, to begin in verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. And Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Bow with me, if you will. Father, we stand before you at this time in your open word. It is my prayer that is the one who is to exegete this passage and to set forth before those here assembled and those who may be watching on Facebook or even will listen to the CDs that the things which I say are things that the text teaches, not my ideas, not my presuppositions, not my supposings, but what your text teaches us, that it might be delivered in a plain way. By the power of your Spirit, combine the spiritual thoughts that are in my mind with spiritual words from my vocabulary, that by your Spirit the truth will go forth and find lodgment in the hearts of those who hear it. We thank you, Father, for giving us understanding and clarity of your word, and we pray that this will all rise to glorifying you. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the things that has always been kind of a source of contention among religious peoples has uh, been the observance of certain holy days. Uh, and it, it, it's, it, you know, there is a sense in which we need to make sure that we understand what the Bible says when it condemns such. But I can remember as I was growing up in the tradition of the church that I was brought up in, that most of the time, whenever we reached a holy day, as the world would put it, like Easter or Christmas or Palm Sunday or whatever, and they would have some kind of a, a program, some churches would. Well, our whole purpose was to talk about how that Easter was not Easter, that there was no command in Scripture to observe it that Christmas was not Christmas, no command to observe it, to the point that if we were going to address it, we always addressed it from the negative, always as a violation of the great command of God. And and we always thought we were on pretty good ground for doing that, uh, because we can read, for example, over in the book of Galatians chapter 4, that Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, says in verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. And so we would quote verse 10. This isn't the only place where Paul talked about the fallacy of observing particular days. And so it appears to me that then to acknowledge Easter in any way, form, or fashion would be in some way or sense a a, a sin. Uh, I can remember hearing a preacher one time when I was a little boy make the statement that you could preach on the birth of Christ on any day except December the 25th. Because if you happen to teach on it on December 25th, you would be feeding the error of the Christmas season. And I can remember doing the same thing with when it came to Easter. 
uh, it's interesting because I, I remember I got myself tangled up one time. I said, Bible never mentions Easter anywhere. Well, it depends on which translation you're using. If you're using the King James Version, it does use the word Easter. Uh, the Greek word I've come to know since then is Pascha, which means Passover. So after Passover, they sought to bring Peter out and have him killed, I think is the passage. But, but nonetheless, that was what I thought I was supposed to do. That was what had been modeled for me. But then later, as I began to, to grow and understand some things, uh, I came across what Romans 14 says about the observation of days, times, and seasons. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14, he says in verse 5, one person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully persuaded or convinced in his own mind. And he who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does it so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to the Lord, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and give thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, his glory. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So now all of a sudden, it doesn't like Paul's scared of the Romans. You know, if one observes a day, fine, he's doing it unto the Lord. If one doesn't observe a day, he's doing it not unto the Lord. And that's okay in either way, for we live and we die unto the Lord. So why didn't he tell them here, I am afraid of you. Because you are observing days and months and years. What, what's the issue here? Context. Over in the book of Galatians, what is Paul fighting there? He is fighting a Judaizing teaching. He is fighting a, a, a doctrine of we need to keep the law and all of its rituals and days in order to be saved. He, throughout the entire epistle, says you all are teaching a different gospel. You're saying Jesus plus circumcision. You're saying Jesus plus those things of the law, which would include that observance of the Sabbath, that observance of the new moon and of the feast days. Now, let me ask you this. Did Paul have a problem with Jews observing those days? No because we still find him getting back to Jerusalem as a Jew for time for Passover, didn't he? Because that was an ethnic thing. They, as a people, as a nation, were led out of Egypt during Passover. Very interesting, uh, but I don't want to get into all of that. Uh, but, but the point is, in Galatians, in his letter, that these people were making those things of conditions of salvation. So what they were saying was, unless you keep the feast of the new moon, unless you circumcise your children, uh, unless you do all of the rituals of the law, then you can't be saved. And Paul said, not so. That's not the basis of your salvation. It is Christ and Christ alone, not Christ plus these uh, shadows of things that were fulfilled within him. So it wasn't so much the observation of those days as it was their thinking behind the observation of those days. So if someone were to come up and say, Christmas must be observed or you can't go to heaven, that's a grievous error. Or Easter, or I'll even go you one further. If you, observe, if you don't observe the first day of the week, you can't go to heaven. Observing the first day of the week is not what saved you. I mean, if anything, we ought to have learned that from what we just did in partaking of the Lord's Supper. I didn't hold up the bread and the fruit of the vine in the calendar. You know, while it was done upon the first day of the week, and that's when we do it, for that is the example, it is not the first day of the week that's our Savior nor even our observance of, the, uh, of anything religious on the first day of the week. 
Now, why do I say all that? <laughs> well, I say all that because we have, as people, a very good, it's not good actually, but a knack, for lack of another word, of missing the point. Do we not? Amen. Of missing the point. So whenever it comes to, for example, the discussion of the resurrection, in my background, and I'm sure with many who have listened or are listening to me now, the resurrection is just lost as we wrangle over the day. The, you know, is, is this Easter, is this really it? Let's fight about that. And, and, and then all of a sudden, the doctrine of the resurrection and its import fades off the scene. You, you see what I'm saying? And the same thing is true with any religious day. You know, if I take the first day of the week and I elevate it up to where I'm making that a condition of salvation, I've missed the point of why the first day of the week is significant. The first day of the week is the day he arose, right? And that was when he showed himself alive. And so that, for that reason, we have then for us some significance in that we follow their example, and that is when they met. Am, am I making myself clear? But we can end up, if not careful, get caught up in wrangling over words and miss what is of utmost importance. Amen. And I think that that's what sometimes happens. Now, in addition to doing that in a religious circle, Satan's also been very good at, 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 at removing many of the religious connotations from any of those days to where Easter becomes not about anything even remotely connected to Christ, but about eating a chocolate bunny or hunting an Easter egg. Now, I'm not opposed to eating a chocolate bunny, so if you want to bring me one, I'll eat it. I always start at its ears. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. My doctor's in here, and I, I have diabetes, and he's not going to like that. In my old days, Doc, I ate bunnies. <laughs> Yeah, my young days, pre-diabetic days. But anyway, I would probably eat one now if I had it. But uh, so that's uh, you know I, I have nothing wrong with that. But but yet you notice that's a secularization of what at some time was a religious connotation. That's what it's become about with most people. It's more people have got less and less concerned about spiritual matters. Then that day has come to that point. Same thing with Christmas, right? You know, now it's about going to the mall, which I love to do, and it's about the tapestry Christmas and the giving of gifts and those kinds of things. Nothing wrong with that, even though I've had many brethren who said you can give a gift up Christmas as long as you don't do it on December 25th. I mean, it's just like we're all over the page. It's crazy as a bat. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that's what we are. Now, I think we mean well, right? We're trying to be obedient. But in the discussion of and the fighting over and, all of the confusion, what gets lost are important theological themes. The birth of Christ is a theological theme that we don't need to lose. I don't care what day you think that it might have been. Okay? The resurrection is of utmost importance because of what it is that it, that it stands for. In fact, Paul says it's this important in 1 Corinthians 15 that if it didn't happen, you're still in your sins and you're still lost. Amen. In Romans chapter 1 and in verse number 4, he says to the Romans in his introductory remarks, he was talking about Christ and he says, who was declared, listen, declared, proclaimed, demonstrated to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead, okay, by the power of the resurrection. So what is the identifying trait that shows us that the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross was successful? that it met the reason for which he died because that tomb was found empty. So now we see the, 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 the importance of that. If, if he had not risen, we're still in our sins. We're still hellbound. If he had not risen, he's not any different than the two thieves that were crucified with him on that same day. Amen. They went into the grave and did not come back out as far as their body is concerned. So his resurrection, the theme of the resurrection is of utmost importance. And so I like to seize 
days like today where people are thinking about this. Not that I think this day is to be esteemed any more than any other. But at the same time, I think that the resurrection needs to be esteemed. Amen. The, the doctrine of the resurrection needs to be esteemed. Don't let Satan entangle you in, in all of the minors and all of the, the, the things like that to where you just don't even uh, understand the great import of some of these great doctrines. But then there's also something else that I think gets lost in the shuffle. So we know it's not about a day. And we say, but it's about an event, right? I mean, you know, we read in Matthew 28. You can read in John chapter 20 of where on the early morning hours, on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdalene, okay, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magla, she goes to the grave, and it is empty. And as we know in our study of the Gospel of John, all we know is that, all she knows is the body's missing. Not a clue as to where it is or what happened. I just know a body went in there, a stone was rolled across the front of that tomb. Now the stone's rolled back, and there is no body. And that set in motion then the events, as John described it, to where she then finally saw Jesus. And Matthew 28 presents it from what took place after her first having seen it. She was the first one all along. Remember, she ran to Peter, and she ran to John, and she says, they've taken his body. Still no clue that he had been raised from the dead. And if you remember, they took off running to the tomb. Who's the fastest runner? See how well you remember. He runs faster. John runs faster. Twice John says, I got there first. <laughs> Peter, when he gets there, he just, uh, uh, he, he bursts into the tomb. John doesn't go into it. Now, what's so interesting about that is that's, the, that's what you're supposed to get out of that. I don't think John wanted to say, you know, I'm, I can run five seconds faster than Peter on a 50-yard dash. I don't think that was what he was saying. I think what he was doing was showing us how that God's people have different dispositions. We have different temperaments. We have different strengths and weaknesses. John is more logical, more methodical, more of a thinker. Peter, he just kind of blurts it out, don't he? And, and, and we need guys like that too, don't we? But, you know, we got to understand that you can be slow. If you're very methodical in your thought process, you can be slow to act. If you, uh, and that can be a detriment. You know, I don't, if I, if I see a train barreling down upon my car, I don't want to sit there and process all of this out. Well, there it is. I wonder how fast it's going. How many seconds more will it be before the train slams into the side of my car and I am killed instantly? I better give this some thought. What do I want to do? Do I put it in neutral and try to back up since my car is not running? Do I dive out of the side of the car and let it just take my car? You ain't got time to think all this. Get out of the way, right? There's where not, not being a person who, who, who thinks very deeply and methodically, that, that could hurt you there. Uh, sometimes our greatest strength becomes also the source of our what? Weakness. Greatest weakness. Peter, all the time, who do you say that I am? Was the question Christ posed to them. Peter said, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blurted it out just like that. <laughs> Great answer, right? I mean, you know, that, 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 that's, that's the way it was. Somebody tried to come and get Jesus, and Peter draws a sword and whacks off their ear. Not so good. Okay, so, you know, but, but you see that. So John goes and just kind of looks in. He's thinking the situation through. Peter gets up there, and he just dives through the hole and says, whoa, he's not in there. And then they leave. But, but Jesus shows himself first to Mary. But you will notice that for the text that I am going to exegete today, we are not even in that final week. This is a month or two before. We're in John chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important because in John chapter 11, we see some truth about the resurrection that usually is never spoken of. And this is in the resurrection of Lazarus. This is the story. That's what this chapter contextually is about. And I think that without this understanding, all of these other issues, 
or should I say with this understanding, all of these other issues will fall in place. Because this text, John chapter 11, tells us something about that resurrection. So let's work our way through this. Now, it says there was a certain man, verse 1 begins with, who was sick. And it is Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister. And it was the Mary who uh, anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Jesus has a history with these people. Remember, though he be divine, he is also fully human. And you know as well as I do that we have some relationships that are deeper with some people than they are with others, right? Would you not agree to that? Uh, We can tell, for example, in the group of the 12 apostles, Jesus from the standpoint of the flesh, who did he favor? Peter, James, and John. He goes to be transfigured. He didn't say, come on, guys. He said, Peter, James, John, you come with me. When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he uh, says his prayer to let this cup pass from me, who does he take with him out there to watch for a while? Peter, James, and John, not the rest of them. So you see, he's got a a closer relationship with those three on the human level than he did the uh, you know than than he did with the others. Well, just as any human, there are going to be people that we are drawn closer and closer and closer to. Well, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus happen to be a family who live in a town about two miles from Jerusalem, uh, known as Bethany. And Jesus many times would spend time at their house. The first time we're introduced to him, if I'm not mistaken, is when uh, Martha's mad because Mary ain't helping her cook. Okay, Jesus has gone to their house. This might have been the first meeting he had with them. And they were sitting, I guess, in the equivalent of their living room or the courtyard or wherever they were. And Mary was just sitting at his feet just soaking up every word he said. Martha's in there, because there's probably a big crowd, saying, I need to feed these people. So she's cooking, and it's getting out of hand. You know, I'm about to burn the biscuits or whatever, because i got too many irons in the fire. <laughs> and so she does, like even the apostles did, and, and they walk back out, and she says to Jesus, Do you not care? You know, and I'm not being critical. Have you ever said those words to God when you approached him in prayer? Do you not care what I'm going through here, God? I mean, here's a man who's going to die for us. And she says, do you not care? The apostles on the boat during the storm said, do you not care we're perishing? Of course he cares. This shows the weakness of the flesh. So here, here she comes in. She says, do you not care that I'm in there slaving over the hot stove and Mary's sitting here doing nothing? Make her get up and help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. Now listen, in the days of the Hebrew language, whenever they called your name twice, you were being reprimanded. Okay, that's kind of like when I grew up, if my mother said Samuel Ellsworth. That was not good. You know, most time I was Sammy. To use the formal name Samuel, and then to throw the middle name in on it, that meant somebody's getting a whooping and it wasn't mom. Okay, so we, we, you know, they would say things twice, repetition, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but there isn't but one thing that's needed, and Mary has chosen the good part that cannot be taken away from her. Let the bread burn. Martha, we'll survive, but you cannot survive without the words of life that I speak. You, you see what he's doing, Susan? But, but, but from there, we just see all these things. Mary is the one who uh, anointed Jesus' hair, I mean feet, with ointment uh, that cost a whole lot. You remember that? And Judas sat over there and said, Man, you know how much that stuff costs? A year's salary. If you had to give it that, sold it and give it to the poor, think of all the people we could have helped. And he said this because he was pilfering money from the treasury. 
But what happened was all the other disciples joined right in with him and said, yeah, that's right, that's right. And that's when Jesus said, listen, stop it. She said, nobody's anointed me for my burial but her. So this is, he's, got a, he's got a history with this family. They were friends. Not just his Lord, but they were his friends. And so uh, Lazarus gets ill. And it's apparently a pretty serious illness. She didn't, they didn't send word to Jesus and say, Lazarus has got a head cold. Oh, he'll be over in a few days, but we just thought you might want to know that. Okay? Oh, he's got a 24-hour bug. No, this must be a serious illness, and I think that bears out because he dies from it. Right? So they send out the SOS. They know Jesus. They know he's healed. They know he's raised people from the dead. So they sent out to him and they said, Behold, the, the, the one whom you love is sick, showing again that history he had with him. And so when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for what? The glory of God. Now what did I tell you earlier in our service? What is God's reason for anything he does the way he does it? For the glory of his name's sake that will resound unto uh, praise of his grace. Here you see it. So Jesus just states it out. All of this that's transpiring is transpiring for God's glory. Listen, everything that transpires on this earth happens for God's glory. Amen. Everything. There's not one thing that doesn't. Now, you might look at some of those things and scratch your head in puzzlement and say, I don't see how in the world this glorified God. We well, hold on. You're not all-knowing. Because if there's something that's going to occur that does not glorify him in the ultimate end, he's not going to let it happen. That's what it means to be sovereign, right? For we know all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. What did he just say? Everything will ultimately end up working for good to those who love God who are called according to his purpose. We've got to get off of the high horse of thinking that unless we can cipher it all out and understand it, we just can't accept it. If that's the case, you're not going to be saved. Okay, You can't think that way. Because you'll never understand it. How unfathomable, Paul says in Romans 11, are your ways. Right? How higher than our thoughts is his thoughts, saith the Lord. So, we find Jesus says, this is for the glory of God specifically so that the Son of God may be glorified. Now, again, for about the third time in this text, we see that history he has with him. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And this here is more or less talking about that, that filial love. Okay, these are good friends. And so when he heard that he was sick, he dropped everything he was doing and he takes off and heads straight to Lazarus. I got to get there and I got to get there fast. What did he do? He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And so after this, that is after he stayed two more days, he turns to his disciples and I have no clue as to where he is. Okay. I just know that by the time he finds Lazarus, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. So he stays two more days where he is. And it's at that point he says to the group that's with him, let's go to Judea again. So he must be in Galilee maybe. Yeah. And the disciples said to him, well, Rabbi, we just came from there not long ago. And when we left, if you remember, everybody was standing around with a rock in their hand getting ready to kill you. You sure you want to go down there again? And so Jesus said, listen, guys. And here's a good, here's a good thing. You know, you, you know how we get afraid of death and don't do certain things because we're afraid of that? I mean, that ought to resound to us right now <laughs> in this day and age, right? Uh, we've shuttered a whole lot of things, church being one of them, because of the fear of dying of dying of a virus and if you remember early on in all of this I said you can't live by that kind of fear you can't live by the fear of dying because if you do you won't do anything you won't ever drive a car because you can wreck in a car can't you and so they, they, they told Jesus they said listen you got to understand you go down there you, you could die aren't you afraid of dying <laughs> he says are there not 12 hours in the day if anyone walks in the day he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world Realize the reality of death. 
That's the light of the truth. You're going to die. He says, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus says, I can't not do what I'm supposed to do simply because I could die. In fact, he knows he will die, right? And this miracle helps bring that death about. And so he just says to him after that comment, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I might wake him out of of sleep. Now here's that famous missing the point again kind of thing. Okay, he was really sick, sick enough that they had to come down here and tell us that he was sick. But now Jesus informs us he's asleep. That's a good thing. If he's resting, why would you want to go up there? Okay? You know. Who wants to, if you are really been, been sick and ill and felt really bad, and then all of a sudden you start feeling better, and you think, all I want to do is sleep. Right? I can remember there was only one time in my life I was in the hospital, and that was down in Alabama. And I thought, well, if what I think I'm here for don't kill me, they're going to, because they woke me up every 15 minutes. <laughs> and then by the morning, I was saying, oh, I want to do is sleep. I'm going to die of tiredness now. Uh, because, you know, they were constantly uh, coming in there. So the idea is, is if, if he's falling asleep, Lord, th- then he's better. He's going to recover. That's what they ask him in verse 12. Now, Jesus, we told in verse 13, says, you know, he's speaking of, of, of death, not, not literal sleep. And so Jesus does what we all have to do, is just sometimes have to talk plainly. And he says, Lazarus is dead. And he says something really strange. I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> do what? what? I'm glad he's dead. For your sakes. I'm glad I wasn't there. So that you may believe this is going to help your faith. So as Jesus gets up and he goes out and he takes off down to Bethany near Jerusalem, about two miles. And Thomas says, let's go with him. If he's going to get killed down there, we might as well die too. You always got to have an optimist in your group, don't you? (laughs) You know, there there he is. <laughs> the guy, if he's going to rain on your parade, there he is. Well, come on, let's go. If he's going to get killed, we might as well die with him too. Uh, <laughs> right. So Jesus comes. He finds out that he had been in the tomb four days already. So, you know, the state of decay is horrible. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, apparently they're a prominent family. And everybody knows them. And, the Jews, they even hired professional mourners, musicians. So, you know, they, 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 they turned weddings into several days. I assume they did the funerals like that too, of, of celebration several days of mourning. And people would come and, and, and spend a lot of time. So, aren't you glad today we're too busy to mourn with people? Okay. I can remember when... Uh, I was a boy. It was a three-day ordeal. You had three days at the, sem- uh, at the funeral home, three nights for people to come, and then finally buried on the fourth. And, and now, you know, it's like uh, visitation from twelve to two, funeral at two. We don't have time. We, we, that's all on the same day. We don't have time, so everybody can squeeze that in to their little busy day. Come by and pay your respects. And so. That wasn't the way it was here. So everybody's there at the house, and somebody apparently came and said, you know, Jesus is coming down the road. Verse 20 says, Martha jumps up. She takes off after him, down there to where he's at. She meets him on the road, in the road coming into Bethany. And she says to him in verse 21, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I don't know the tone in which she said this. I think some commentators seem to think that she is being critical of Jesus. I doubt it. I don't tend to think that way. Uh, I think she was just this is affirming her faith in him as a great healer. That's what I think. I don't think it was like, you know, if you'd have got here earlier, this wouldn't have happened. I don't think that's what she's saying. I think she's saying, oh, Lord, you know what? We've been through this an ordeal. He died. And I know if you'd have been here, this could all have been prevented. But, you know, I understand you're somewhere else. That's more the way. Because they're friends. You know, she's not going to come down there and accuse him of causing Lazarus to die. 
And she says, even now I know that what, see, I think that's why that verse is in there, verse 22. She follows that statement up. I know that you're of God, and whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I don't think she meant when she asked that, will you raise him? She tries to talk him out of it because he stinks. <laughs> right? So I, I, that, that statement there is just, you know, uh, I have faith in you. And I know if you'd have been here, we could have stopped this because I know whatever you ask of God, God would do. So if you'd have been here, you could have asked God to heal him and God would have. But alas, he is now what? Dead. And so Jesus says, your brother, here it comes, will rise again. So he appeals to the fact that death is not final. Now that's not an earth-shattering doctrine to most of the Jews of Jesus' day. The Pharisees, the leading sect of the Jews, believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not, but the Pharisees did. So it was a common belief, just like we believe in the resurrection of the dead. I even know unbelievers who believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so, therefore, Jesus says, your brother's going to rise again. And she says, I know. That is a comfort. It's not right now a comfort, but it'll be a comfort because I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Death is not final. That is true. Okay? Death is not the end of anything. Okay? It just isn't. And to that statement, listen. Listen carefully. Verse 25. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. Wait a minute. I thought the resurrection was a day. He didn't mention a day. Martha did. She mentioned the last day. Which is certainly true. On the last day, Hall will be raised. The resurrection is an event. Well, Jesus says the hour is coming and now is when all are in the grave shall hear my voice and come forth. So it is an event. But before you pay attention to the day, before you pay attention to the event, you need to understand the source of the resurrection is a person. Amen. I am the resurrection, and the life. Did you catch that? I am. It's about a person. We have got to, church, get Jesus back where he needs to be. Everything is about him. Amen. On Fridays, we've been meeting after our psalm lesson and studying how to present the gospel. And unfortunately, and I, I'll start with myself, I don't do it anymore. When people want to present the gospel message to someone, you know what we generally go to? Some kind of practice that we feel like we're right on. You're talking to someone who, who's not a Christian, or maybe they go to a church that doesn't observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday, and so I want to tell them why they need to be offering the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Now, they need to know that. But I need to know first that they understand who Jesus is, right? Amen. When you preach the gospel, you're preaching about the work of a person. You're not preaching a system. You're not preaching denominational dogma. That's not sharing the gospel. There's a place in our teaching for those things. That's after we've presented the gospel and they've accepted it. But see, we are so fleshly that our desire is to prove ourselves right in our practices. And if we prove ourselves right in our practices, we can show them where we're right and they'll join us because we're right in our practices. So then we just help Satan plant the tares in the church pews. Because now here they sit, right? Convinced their practice is right, but have no love or affinity for the Lord Jesus Christ. So then when you come along and you start preaching that the gospel is about Jesus, they get mad. 
I've had my brethren call me and say, well, I can't believe you think salvation is about just Jesus. And I think, well, you know, I know why you're where you are. You're where you are because you somehow got convinced that being right was what saved you on some practice. But Jesus didn't say, these processes, you need to get them. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And for me to be the resurrection factor for you, to take away the sting of death for you, you must believe in me. Because he says, he who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? How come he didn't go into a big discourse about, well, now you got to do this and you got to do that and you need to make sure you dot this I and I want you to cross that T and you better make sure you're doing it. He didn't do any of that. Why? Because that's not the cause of your salvation. He saves you. And you receive his salvic work through what? Your faith in him. Your faith in Him. Do you believe that, church? Amen. You better. Mm-hmm. Or you're still in your sins. And by the way, here is, here is a theology of death you can hang your hat on. You ever sit by the deathbed of someone? Mm-hmm. Gone to visit somebody that's dying? You always wonder what to say. Because not everybody that dies, dies in a coma. They may right before death takes them, but, you know, you can tell. You know, and you go to visit them, they're in the hospital, or you go to their house, and they're laying on their bed. And and what we do is we end up lying. Because we don't want to let them know that they're dying. Why don't you want them to know they're dying? They know they are. But we go in, we'll go into a hospital room, somebody's laying there with the tubes all in them, and just barely able to talk. And you walk up, and it's obviously dying, and say, looking pretty good there. And we didn't mean that. Well, it won't be long. If it's a woman, you'll be back home taking care of the grandbabies and cleaning that house. It's a man. Oh, the golf course, you'll be out there hitting them with the best of us. And then you walk out the door and tell your buddy who went in there with you. They ain't going to be here long, are they? You just lied to those people. What they need to hear is if they're a Christian, they need to be reminded that Jesus is the resurrection. That he is the life. You know that if you're a Christian. And remember, if you believe in him, you will live even if you die. So it's not that bad. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Remind them of what they believe if they're a saint, if they are a child of God. They want to hear that. You can put some teeth in that. You can hang your hat on that. Those are comforting words. Right? You hold the hand of the dying and you say, Remember, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And though you may be dying, you believe in him. And you will live even if you die. This isn't it, friend. Don't lie to them. Don't try to make them think they're going to get better. Because first of all, they know it. They know it. We know. Don't we? We know. I don't think she got it. (laughs) Because she says, Yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes in the world. Now, while that's going on, somebody runs down and tells Mary, He's here. And so, Mary, up to this point, has not come forward. And she gets up and runs down the road, too. And uh, everybody follows her. You know, Jesus had to get them out of the house. She didn't come when she'd heard he was there the first time. Why does he want them out of the house? They got to see what he's getting ready to do. 
He's going to prove that he's the resurrection. Why? Because he has power over death. So when she hears he's there, he didn't say, just tell her, don't worry about it, I'll come up there. No, they send a word, and Mary just jumps up and takes off down, and here everybody runs out behind her. They go down to the tomb. Well, we know the rest of that story, don't we? And he, in his loud voice, cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And there Lazarus stood. And by the way, this is a prime example of our salvation. All of us, before we came to Christ and heard the call of his voice and of the gospel, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. That's what Paul said. We were rotting corpses. We weren't injured people. We weren't just sick people. You don't, ha- you know, uh, 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 it, it's, uh, you know, we were dead. That's what the scripture says. You're dead in your sins and your trespasses. Beyond feeling, he says. Right? Lazarus was dead, and the only thing that will wake him from his death is what? The voice of our Lord and of our Savior. And so when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, that's the gospel call applied to the heart by who? The Holy Spirit. Right? Opening the eyes, opening the heart, unstopping the ears so the glorious message of salvation can enter. And then Lazarus stands in the gaping doorway of that tomb, so much like us as well, still wrapped hand and foot in his grave clothes. We've heard the call. We've been raised. You know, when we come to faith, we are planted into Christ by the Holy Spirit. For by one baptism, we are all baptized into one body. Okay? We are all baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That's not water baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There is a water baptism. But that's the uniting of us with Jesus. Okay, that, that's, that, that's the uniting into his death, into his burial, into his resurrection. And so we become what he is. Ducking someone in water won't do that because I can duck anybody in water. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. But Jesus cried out to them, come forth. But the point I want to make is he's still wrapped in what? The, the grave clothes. Yeah. Are we still wrapped in our grave clothes? Mm-hmm. It's called the flesh. Yeah. Still problematic, isn't it? Very problematic. Mm-hmm. We still wrestle it and we fight it. We still yeah. stink. We still stink. But the day's coming. And if you remember, Jesus told him, he said, loose him and let him go. The day's coming, we're going to be loosed and let go. And that's the great day of judgment. So think of these doctrines about the person of Christ, not as of events and days. When somebody says, what's the resurrection all about? It's about my Savior who has power over death. That's what the resurrection's all about. Well, how do you know? Well, there was a day in which he rose. So now you work the day and event, but you start with Jesus and work back. Don't start with the day and the event and then go to Jesus. Okay? That's how we present it. Listen, today, if you've not known the power of that resurrection, the power of the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we encourage you to come while we stand and while we sing.